1871, on board the Polaris, after returning from a sledging trip to map the north and attempting to be the first man to reach the North Pole, Captain Hall sipped his coffee. The coffee was sweeter than usual and slightly burned his stomach. He complained, but as the rations were low, he finished his cup. He soon was vomiting and delirious, accusing his second-in-command, Buddington, of poisoning him. In a few days, he would be dead. One year later, still trapped in the Arctic, half of his crew would be stranded on an iceberg as they watched the Polaris sail into the distance. As their island of ice and snow drifted through the Arctic, slowly melting, they were left with a choice, starve or murder. This is the story of the Polaris Expedition. In June 1871, the Polaris departed New York City, captained by Charles Francis Hall, on an expedition to reach the North Pole. Captain Hall was a businessman from Cincinnati. He was an extravagant entrepreneur with a background that included engraving, metalworking, and newspaper publishing. However, he had no real sailing experience or academic background. He was self-taught, an avid reader, and was fascinated by the latest technology. He was also extremely interested in the Arctic and admired the recent men that had led expeditions in search of the North Pole. In 1845, a British Arctic expedition led by Captain Sir John Franklin sailing the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror was lost. Captain Hall was fascinated by the Lost Franklin expedition and used his own captivating personality to raise support and money for his own expeditions. He led 1860 and 1864 expeditions to find the missing Franklin crew. These expeditions failed, but had provided him invaluable Arctic sailing experience. He was also able to garner favorable relationships with the local native Inuit. He was then able to leverage his Arctic experience and Inuit contacts into support for the Polaris expedition. Hall was named captain by Secretary of the Navy George M. Robeson, who secured $50,000 from Congress to fund the expedition. Hall bought a 387-ton screw propeller steam-powered tugboat named the Periwinkle. He had the ship modified for the Arctic expedition by fitting it as a four-topsail schooner and adding solid oak planks over the hull and iron sheets over the bow. A new engine that could burn seal and well oil was also added. Four well boats and a scow were placed on board. The Polaris and its captain were set for the expedition. One of the many problems with this trip was that Captain Hall was not the only captain. Although Hall had plenty of contacts and experience surviving in the Arctic, he didn't have any sailing experience. Hall was smart enough to know that he needed a very experienced sailing captain. Hall requested whaling captain Sidney Ozias Buddington, but because of a prior engagement, Buddington declined. So Captain Hall requested assistance from another whaling captain, George Emery Tyson, who also had prior engagements and also declined. However, shortly thereafter, both prior engagements fell through and both men ended up accepting positions on the Polaris. Buddington became the ship's sailing master and Tyson became the assistant navigator. To compound the difficulties of this trip, on a previous voyage, Tyson and Buddington had quarreled over Buddington not allowing two of Tyson's Inuit guides, Ipirvik and Tukalito, on board a whaling vessel. The bad blood was still present. So now, there were three captains on board, and at least two of them didn't get along. But the officers were set, and there was plenty of sailing and Arctic experience to presume success of the mission. The crew was made up of mostly Germans and Americans, with one Dane and one Swede, who made it known early on that their allegiance was to the Germans. There were 25 officers and crew aboard the Polaris, and this time, the Inuit hunters, translators, and guides, Ypirovic and Tukulido, were on board along with their infant son. Even before they set sail, Captain Hall was viewed as overbearing and micromanaging, even to the other officers. However, after several crew members deserted, the ship departed Brooklyn Navy Yard on June 29, 1871. Before they had even reached St. John's, Canada, the crew had separated into cliques. 
Bessels, the chief scientist, had outright rejected Captain Hall as any sort of authority over the science staff. This was backed by Frederick Meyer, a German meteorologist that worked for the U.S. Army Signal Corps. Quickly, the Germans along with the Dane and the Swede formed a group and the Americans formed an opposing group. On the way to Upernavik, the Polaris was met by the USS Congress and captained by Henry Davenport. By this time, many of the crew had already made up their mind that they would not stay on board all the way to the North Pole. They despised Captain Hall as they believed he was incompetent and micromanaged the other officers and the crew. When the U.S. Congress arrived, Captain Hall asked Captain Davenport to mediate their discussions. However, at the first sign of insubordination from the German meteorologist Myers, Captain Davenport threatened to have Myers shackled. At this, the entire German group threatened to quit the expedition. To avoid losing the expedition right then and there, Captain Hall and Davenport conceded and no punishment was handed down. This event further reinforced the notion that Hall was more of an acting captain rather than an authority on their voyage. They reached Upernavik on August 18, 1871, where they were supposed to pick up Hans Hendrik. Hendrik was a skilled Inuk hunter and very welcome, but he brought along his wife and children. Captain Hall, as well as his detractors, could all agree that this was an extremely unwelcome surprise. Bessels, the German chief scientist and surgeon, wrote that Hans refused to see that his wife and children were extremely unwelcome extras on such an undertaking, and Captain Hall even stated that they were four useless mouths. Later developments into this voyage would prove that they had a right to be concerned. After picking up Hendrik and his unwelcome family, the Polaris headed further north across Baffin Bay, and on September 2nd, they reached the furthest north parallel. At this point, the expedition had a choice to make, keep pushing forward or turn back. The original plan was to go to the North Pole, but the German crew had already made it apparent that they did not want to follow Hall all the way to the North Pole, and even if they did, they would make sure that Hall did not receive the credit. Buddington, representing the German contingent, with the exception of Myers and a few other crewmen, wanted to turn back. The crew was disgruntled and hated Captain Hall. Hall and Tyson wanted to press further north, as did Myers and a few of the other crew. As Tyson and Hall outnumbered the lone officer, Buddington, it was decided to push northward to Thank God Harbor. Buddington stormed out of the meeting, further increasing his hatred for Hall, and the Polaris set sail for the north. They reached Thank God Harbor on September 10, 1871, and dropped anchor just offshore to ride out the winter. However, Captain Hall couldn't decide who to take with him. The obvious choice was his most trustworthy companion and second-in-command, according to Hall, the American navigator, George Tyson. But if Hall and Tyson both left, Hall's nemesis on board, and as it turns out, alcoholic, Buddington, would be in charge of the ship. So Hall took first mate Hubert Chester, and Tyson stayed behind to watch after the ship and Buddington. Their trip was only two weeks and not successful. When they returned, Captain Hall became ill after drinking a cup of coffee. He complained of the coffee being too sweet and burning his stomach. He began vomiting and became delirious, accusing the Germans of poisoning him, specifically the chief scientist and physician Emil Bessels. He refused treatment from Bessels and would only eat food and drink liquids prepared for him by Tucolito. After a few days of feeling better and Bessels hounding him to look after him, Bessels finally convinced Captain Hall to allow Bessels to examine him and provide treatment. Almost immediately, Captain Hall fell ill, vomiting, became delirious, and collapsed. Four days later, on October 8, 1871, Captain Hall died. Bessels diagnosed Hall with apoplexy, which today can be any of an aneurysm, heart attack, stroke, or other illness. The crew took his body to shore and buried it. Needless to say, Captain Hall's death was extremely suspicious, but we'll get back to that later. After burying Captain Hall's body, Buddington took over as acting captain, who of course was allies with Bessels. In terms of command, Tyson was second, as he had been loyal to Hall. He wasn't viewed to have much authority over the crew. While Buddington and most of the crew were getting drunk and resigned to returning home, Tyson and Chester were still driven to reach the North Pole. Furthermore, Buddington had handed out the firearms to the crew, and a plan had developed within some crew members to claim that they had reached further north than they actually had. All the more reason for Tyson and Chester to actually reach that far north. In one of their expeditions, in an attempt to map the north, Ipirovic showed up with orders from Buddington. The Polaris had found open water, 
and they were heading back south. Chester and Tyson were to return to the ship immediately. The expedition was over, and there was nothing they could do about it. In October 1872, on the way back south, a year after Captain Hall had mysteriously died and a drunk had taken over, the Polaris ran aground on an iceberg that was pinned to the ground in Smith Sound. They were stuck, and on the night of October 15th, Schumer, checking on the hull, found that water was flooding the ship and the pumps couldn't keep up. Buddington ordered cargo to be thrown overboard to improve buoyancy. The crew began tossing over cargo without care and much of it was lost. Some of the crew began spending the nights out on the ice while the ship was trapped. It was on one of these nights that the ice broke up, separating from the ship. Tyson, Meyer, six of the crew, the cook, the steward, and all of the Inuit. When the sun rose in the morning, the stranded seamen could see the Polaris in the distance. Polaris was only 8 to 10 miles away, so they waved a large black cloth that the crew of the Polaris should easily see against the white landscape of the ice, but the Polaris kept sailing away. Tyson estimated that they had 1,900 pounds of food, which should last the group quite a while if they rationed. However, being stuck on an ice floe in Baffin Bay, they had no idea how long it would be before they would reach land or would be found. They did have two well boats and two kayaks, but in order to use the boats to reach land, they had to know where they were going. Meyer believed that they were drifting through Davis Strait near Drisco Island. He convinced the crew that they would soon see Drisco Island and be able to paddle the welling boats to land to go against Tyson's attempts to conserve food. In November 1972, the group, starving, with Myers reassuring them that they would find Drisco Island soon, they went on an eating binge and went through most of the little food that they had left. After this, weeks went by without any sight of land. As they drifted further south, the ice slowly melted and broke apart. The ice was their floating island that was keeping them alive. The Inuit made igloos for everyone to stay warm throughout the nights, but this did little to sway people's minds when they began starving, particularly Myers. Myers believed the Inuit to be inferior and wanted to murder them for food. He received pushback from the others and gave up on the idea. However, if they continued starving, a decision was going to have to be made, and everyone knew what that decision was going to be. Luckily, it didn't come to that. Being experienced hunters, Ipirvik and Tukulido were able to kill several seals and polar bears feeding the entire group, keeping them alive. While Tyson's group was adrift on the ice floe, Buddington's group on the Polaris wasn't faring much better. With the coal stores running low and the ship severely damaged, on October 16, 1872, Buddington ordered the ship to be run aground near Etta. Lumber was torn from the Polaris to build huts to survive the winter. After the pumps on the Polaris stopped, the ship flooded and tilted over on its side. Again, it was the local Etta Inuit who helped the men survive through the winter. On April 30th, 1873, the whaler Tigris was on a routine hunting voyage when a group of people were spotted on an ice floe. The whaler rescued the 19 members of Tyson's group that were trapped on the ice. All members of the group survived. They drifted over 1,800 miles and had survived for more than six months on the ice drifting through Baffin Bay. The Tigris took the group to St. John's, Newfoundland and was then commissioned by the U.S. Navy to search for the Polaris. With the help from the local Inuit, Buddington's group survived the winter, salvaged wood from Polaris, and built two new boats. The group set sail on June 3, 1873, and on June 23, they were spotted by the Ravenscraig. In all, the only person that died this disastrous attempt to reach the North Pole was Captain Hall. His death was immediately investigated after all voyagers were returned home. After interviewing every officer and reviewing all diaries that were available, they concluded that Captain Hall died of natural causes. However, even this was met with skepticism, as many of the diaries that were kept by the officers and crew were missing entries from the time of Captain Hall's death. Furthermore, many of the testimonies were inconsistent. In 1968, Chauncey C. Loomis was researching a biography of Captain Charles C. Hall, Weird and Tragic Shores, when he was so perplexed by the captain's death that he sought to solve the mystery once and for all. He had Hall's body exhumed from its burial place on the shore of Thank God Harbor. The body was preserved in the permafrost, providing a perfect specimen for analysis. 
Tests on tissue samples of bone, fingernails, and hair revealed that in the last two weeks of Captain Hall's life, he had received large doses of arsenic, which is consistent with the reported symptoms. It should also be noted that Buddington, Meyer, and Bessels all stated that the expedition would have been better off without Captain Hall. He also complained of his coffee being sweet and burning his stomach. This would be consistent with arsenic poisoning as it has a sweet taste. The steward, John Heron, had served the coffee in question to Captain Hall. However, in his testimony, he stated that the cook, William Jackson, made the coffee and he did not know who had access to the coffee before Hall finally drank it. Throughout this astounding two-year journey of survival, the only person to have died was the captain, poisoned by his own crew. Was it the cook, Bessels, Meyer, Buddington? We will never know. This is a mystery that will remain unsolved. This is True Mysteries. Please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.